This episode of Chains is sponsored exclusively by Charlie Foxtrot Brewing. Ask about beers from this veteran-owned brewery in tap rooms across southwest Florida and western North Carolina. Thank you for supporting our veterans. Chains, part 13, written by Dustin O'Nash, narrated by Anthony Jesties. My cousin Clark had invited me to volunteer at Penelope Farm a few times before. They'd really helped to turn his life around there. He sounded proud for the first time since I could remember, and being the only ally that he had left in the family, it fell for me to go see him. The Bollington family is not a fairy forgiving bunch. The drive over gave me a sense of cautious optimism. The roads had a type of happy rhythm. At one moment, pulling some cunning, topsy-turvy jaunt along sheer cliffs, the next making a wide arc around a brown-signed national treasure, and the next still, opening to vast, windy vales with A-frame cottages nestled in the hills. The asphalt eventually gave way to well-worn gravel fire roads, and then again to dirt tracks and so on until I was literally driving up to a barn in fresh summer grass. In front of the barn were scores of small trees wrapped at the roots in burlap, all lined up like soldiers. I almost didn't recognize my cousin as he came bounding across the field. He was sporting a deep tan and a giant black beard just like our grandpa had. I only really recognized him from his silly, crooked smile, which always seemed like it had once belonged to a pirate or a successful used car salesman. Either way, his huge beard couldn't hide it. Old Blackbeard! I yelled at him half mockingly as he slowed down only a little before picking me up, bear hugging me, and carrying me about ten feet from the momentum. He smelled like new sweat in the outside, a far cry from the unabated alcohol fumes I had grown used to over the years. Chris, old oh man, I'm so glad you made it, he said after finally setting me down. You're super early. But I'm pretty sure it doesn't matter. We're just finishing up with the whips, and then we're gonna start with these bald and burlapped," he said, gesturing to the rows of smaller plants. What are they? I asked as we walked back to my car to get my overnight bag. Baby apple trees, he said before confiding. They're actually way overdue for planting. Look, don't tell anyone, but this family day thing is more about emergency volunteers than anything else. I mean, it's a great idea, and I'm glad for it, but we're in deep doo-doo. Mr. P's been too sick to work. He's getting better, finally. I think it has to do with diabetes or something. On top of that, he can't really see enough to tell people or things apart. We spent the rest of that day planting those apple trees, and that night sleeping hard after a smorgasbord of venison, butter beans, cantaloupe, sweet potatoes, and fried, cheese curd, stuffed zucchini blossoms. I went up there regularly for about two months. We planted the whole damn field. The hard work, the hot sun, the buggy fields. Nothing could put us off our childhood friendship that was lost to mistake, vice, and time. (sighs) These were the memories I kept with me as things got worse. As Mr. P changed from an honest, strong farmer to some kind of demented animal. As Miss Leah turned from mother of wayward souls to a desperate and wicked crone who was determined to use people for her own delusional ends. After the two months, Mr. P got well enough to be up and about. During my last night there, he began to talk about the dreams he had while he was sick, and about how he was sure they'd come true. We were all concerned for him and figured that the sickness had done a number on him and that his age might have finally caught up to him. He told us of a metal man living deep underground that hated everything above him and how the sky would torment him with rain or tales of beautiful sunsets that he could never see. He also told us about barren fields full of dead trees, which did actually happen. By the time I returned, about a month later, we had lost the whole field. 
Mr. P told us that it must have just been a few weeks too late, but I knew he didn't believe that. I didn't believe it either. They were healthy trees. Something wasn't right. Miss Leah, or Ma, as she was known to most on the farm, had started bringing in a lot more people. At first to compensate for Mr. P, then after the success of Family Day, just for free labor. After the fields began to die, most of the people just hung around and did nothing. Miss Leah's state of mind seemed to worsen with the fields. By the time I returned, hard drugs, alcohol, and prostitution were the currency. Miss Leah did nothing to stop it. She only enforced rules for people that didn't do as she asked. She was echoing things in Mr. P's dreams, especially the one about the hateful metal man underground. Her requests got stranger and stranger, even asking for one of the industrial sprinklers to be taken apart and rewelded to some strange specifications. I realized halfway through the first day back that my cousin had relapsed. In that environment, no one had a chance. He told me that night that they had enough people, and then jokingly added that the apple trees would do just fine without me. When I reminded him that they had already died, he insisted that I leave that night. Things would have gotten more heated had there not been some commotion. From the chatter, it seems like Mr. P had injured himself pretty badly. I followed the small crowd to the barn where I saw Miss Leah leading some chanting over Mr. P. A few of the people were following her lead. They had some kind of device made out of rebar that they were attaching to his leg that looked kind of like a brace. They wrapped it around his mangled leg and welded it shut. I caught a glimpse of Mr. P as they were doing this. He had a crazed grin on his face. Ms. Leah suddenly stopped her chanting. I was amazed to see Mr. P get to his feet. The blisters from his burn were growing almost as I watched. He started to laugh and said, I feel no pain. I am his chosen. And Miss Leah started asking each person, as if in some kind of ritual, that they accept this title. The horror of the events caught up with me all at once. And seeing that I was at the back of the pack already, I escaped into the twilight evening. I was ashamed at leaving my cousin and started making a plan to come back to him. I let three weeks pass while working up the nerve to go back. It was too long to wait. I skipped out on work that Friday. The mill was almost out of season by then anyway. They wouldn't need me. I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. I decided that my best plan was to pretend to join them then kidnap Clark and check him into a real rehab facility. The rest of them can burn in hell for all I cared. I parked about a mile from the farm and hiked in. There were about 12 people on the porch of the main house, up the hill from the barn. I held out a bottle of liquor, and that was all it took to get in. I saw Clark in the kitchen skinning a fresh-caught deer. He looked terrible. Worse than he'd ever looked on the streets. In three weeks he had lost about ten pounds, his hair was thinning, and he was pale as a ghost. I weakly said his name and he spun around fast with the cleaver in one hand. I swore allegiance to him and to whatever was happening at the farm. I even included some bits of what I could remember from Mr. P's dreams. I thought it sounded hollow, but he bought it. He didn't seem entirely there. Over the next two days, I saw that things had stayed just about as crazy. Clark was in charge of coming up with a plan for someone in the barn. It seemed like they were getting another one of his chosen, as hokey as it sounded. Each mention of the title made me increasingly unsettled. Things seemed to be getting out of hand with Mr. P, who he was now calling Corey, and he planned to double-cross him. 
it was going to be my job to sneak into the old slaughterhouse under the barn and kill whoever was down there. All this time, I was never alone with Clark. I figured I'd end up clobbering him to get him out of there, but the opportunity never presented itself. That Monday evening, I saw someone driving toward the farm and up to the fence. An immediate sense of dread washed over me. I saw a small handheld light flick on and the face of someone I knew. It was Hannah. After my last encounter with Mr. P and the chanting, I told her never to come here. Her small light made her stick out like a sore thumb. So I panicked and ran downstairs. I was about to go out and stop her when Clark caught me and pulled me aside to get final confirmation about his plan to double cross Mr. P. I distractedly agreed with everything he said in a rush to get out the door to stop Hannah from coming up here. I caught a view of her out the window just as her light went out. Moments later I saw her being carried by Mr. P towards the barn. I had to do something. I scrambled down to the cellar knowing I could get into the barn from there. I ripped the boards from the frame of the secret passage and made my way through the tunnels. I was just about to enter the slaughterhouse when I heard Hannah scream. She had come all this way looking for me and could end up getting hurt, or worse. I wasn't going to let that happen. I ran full speed down the corridor ready to let loose on anything in my path. As I began to turn the corner to where she was, something hit me hard across my face and I lost balance. I had trapped my arm underneath me and it broke terribly. Immediately I was being attacked by someone and blacked out. I came to in the barn with Mr. P looking at me and roughly shifting my broken arm. I screamed out in pain oh. as he set it back into place. I demanded to know who was down there, but Mr. P gave me no indication. I doubt he even knew. At this point, there was no semblance of the old man. Only his chosen was left. As he picked me up to bring me to the house, I tried to yell to Hannah. I wanted her to leave and never come back to this hellhole. Mr. P slapped a hand over my mouth and prevented me from speaking took all of my strength to take his hand off of me. I yelled for Hannah to leave. The pain from my arm did me in. My vision narrowed quickly. And I was out.